Hey, welcome. You know, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 talks about we are the chosen ones for His foundation. And today I want us to see that the foundation is set and that we need to stand up and go and preach the word and the gospel to the world. That brings us forth to what was about to happen, and that is the message. Listen, because it applies to us. Well, today's a special day, isn't it? I mean, if you didn't know it, uh, you've missed out because today is Father's Day, so I want to wish you happy Father's Day. And, I, and I, I've got some interesting facts that I'm not going to be able to share. Matter of fact, let me start my timer. I'm going to try to be nice to the fathers today in, in powerful ways. The, the best way I can be nice to you is for you to pay attention and get involved in the message so no matter how long it goes, you get into it, okay? And it doesn't seem that long, okay? So first of all, some things I've thought about Father's Day. Uh, the great thing a father can do for his children is love their mother. That's the greatest thing a father can do for his children is, is love their mother. Uh, someday I will find my prince, my daughter once said, but my daddy will always be my king. That's a great line. I tell you, girls, pick that up and make your dad just feel over the top, okay? All right. A father is someone who carries pictures in his wallets where he used to carry his money. Some of you will get that later. Some of you don't even know what a wallet is, I don't think. So uh, um, you know what a card is. And so uh, you got a little pouch for your card, you're good. But uh, uh, those are some things I thought about as fathers. Father's Day has some history. There's some history to it. Um, there are traces of evidence of Father's Day going all the way back to the Babylonian era. Some 4,000 years ago, a boy, a young boy named uh, Imisu carved a Father's Day message on a card made of clay, wishing his Babylonian father good health and a long life. They've been honoring fathers for thousands of years. It took a little while for Father's Day to be caught on here in the United States, though. Uh, there's, there's evidence, like I said, that, that it was taking place all over the world and, and even in the United States. And, it was celebrated in different states and things like that, but uh, as early as 1908, we have evidence of it here in the United States, but it was officially recognized as Father's Day uh, in 1972. 1972 is the first time, and, and some of you say, well, I've, I've, always, I've always known there was Father's Day. Well, it became an official holiday in 1972, and... Uh, uh, 58 years, I want you to pay attention to this, it was 58 years after President Woodrow Wilson named Mother's Day an official national holiday. Some of that just went right over your head. 58 years after we honor mothers, they decided it's time to honor dads. That sounds about right. Statistically, children with a father have a better life. When dad... When dad comes to Christ first, 93% of the time the family follows. Wow, that's a great number. When, when the father comes to Christ, 90, and, they, and he comes to Christ first, 93% of the time the family will come to Christ also. Now, it, it drops dramatically if the mother's the first, 17% of the family comes. And if it's the children, 3.5% come. Now, I don't want to degrade any of any of the mothers or the children, but we spent a lot of time uh, honoring and, and going after the mothers. We spend a lot of time uh, going after the children to get them saved. And I don't want to stop any of that because that's important. But I tell you, fathers, you are vital to the salvation of your family. It's important. It's important. Fatherhood is a wonderful thing that cannot be taken lightly. Fatherhood is not just the ability to create life because if, if that was fatherhood, we'd have a whole bunch of fathers around here. Good fathers. Oh, I created how many lives? No, it's not just about creating life. Fatherhood carries with it the responsibility of the life that it helped create. And we've lost that. We've lost that in our world. We've lost that in our culture. we lost it in our culture, at least not around the world necessarily, but in our culture, we've lost it. 
Father's Day messages are difficult in our society, in our culture, because we have abandoned or allowed fatherhood to be destroyed in so many ways. We have the culture that has demeaned the father and destroyed fatherhood. We have divorce. We have governmental intervention. We have gender equality and confusion. We have missing accountability. You, you, you can have children and, and not have any responsibility or accountability to them. We have generations of fatherless families. And at the end of this message, I hope to have time to share some of my thoughts about that. But here's the fact. Fathers are important. They are vital to a good family, a good country, a good nation. We don't have perfect families because we don't have perfect fill-in-the-blank. Now, immediately when I said that, some of you would say, we don't have perfect families because we don't have perfect fathers. And, and some of you would say, well, we don't have perfect families because we don't have perfect mothers. Depends on your point of view. Some of you would say we don't have perfect families because we have children. <laughs> well, let me tell you, would your family be better if your father was better? Would your, would your family be better if your mother was better? Would your family be better if your children were better? And the answer is yes. Yes, it's easy. It's, it's one of those things you could get, you could go yes, 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 multiple choice, and get 100%. I was telling the guys the other day, uh, uh, Dr. Graham asked me about some of my, my uh, studies. Uh, and uh, I admitted, when I got out of high school, I got out early, I graduated early from high school, went, went to college, and, and I figured out I figured out how to pass tests when I was young. And, and I got to tell you, a lot of times we just figure out how to, how to get by, how to, how to score a good grade and, and get a passing score. But let me tell you, it's important that we recognize that good fathers make good families, good mothers make good families, and good children make good families. What makes the better family is what? God and a better father, God and a better mother, God and better fathers and mothers, and God and better fathers, mothers, and children. That's what makes a good family. So who will we allow to determine and form the present and future standards of fatherhood? We we've we've tend to give that over to the government and to, to, um, uh, to our culture. And let me tell you, we need to give who forms our present and future fatherhood to God and let him form it and let him make it. For me in my house, it was, it, it's God. It's God that leads and guides me in my fatherhood. Have I made mistakes? I've made mistakes. Don't ask my kids. Uh, but, but I've made mistakes. I'll be honest. I've made mistakes. And, and uh, uh, I went to lunch a week ago with somebody that, that was uh, uh, talking about some of their mistakes in, in fatherhood. And I got to tell you, the mistakes... All of us have made them. Every one of us has made mistakes. But ultimately, let me tell you what, the mistake doesn't destroy. It's continuing in the mistake that destroys. We've got to jump out of it. We've got to recognize our failures, our faults, our mistakes. We have to apologize. We have to repent. We have to come back to, to God's way, God's plan, and we have to say, I want you to lead me and guide me. In my household, I had a great father. My dad was a, a great man, and, and I got to tell you, it's his face, my sister has done a great job, and my mother posting his face all over the internet this last uh, few days. And, and every time I see it, you know what I do? I, I, it breaks me up. I have a hard time with it. I, I, I'm struggling with the loss of my father still. From 2019, some of you say, well, that was a few years ago. You ought to be over. Well, let me tell you, I still would like to pick up the phone and call him. Ask his advice, ask his, ask his instruction. But dad was a great man. He, I'm lucky to have him. Some of you haven't had the example of a great father. Some of your fathers were, were, were neglective. They were abusive. They were addicted. They, they had issues. But let me tell you, I had issues. I've had issues. It's what you do once those issues are recognized in your life. Once the Holy Spirit of God comes to you and says, this is something you need to change, make the change. That's it. That's it. The problem is when you, 
refuse to make the change. I like it just the way I am. Well, when you get to heaven, you tell God that, okay? I like me just the way I am. Well, there's going to be a difference there. There's going to be a difference of opinion. I think his opinion will matter. Some of, some of you have never had a positive role model as a father in your life. And so you don't, you don't put as much into fatherhood as, as you should. I don't have time and ability to fix fatherhood in our world, especially the past. But I can point you to the fixing of your fatherhood in the future. It's found in Jesus Christ. It's found in God the Father. It's found in his word. And through them, you can change your present and you can change your future. Sigmund Freud said this, I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need of a father's protection. As a father's protection. We live in a world of sin that continues to infiltrate dismantle and destroy every institution that was set in place by God to protect the family from the enemy. The very first man that was created was created to work. I know that's a dirty four-letter word. Uh, someone told me that again uh, even Thursday night. He said, stop using the word work from the pulpit. I know he was kidding, but uh, uh, he says that's a dirty four-letter word. Let me tell you, he created man to work and to protect his family. Adam failed to do that in the garden with Eve. He should have stepped between Eve and the serpent and pointed his, his finger in the, the, the nose of that serpent and said, no, we will not listen to you. You will not communicate with my wife any longer. Boy, that would have changed everything, wouldn't it? The same thing for men. We, we are created to be protectors. Which brings me to the message today I have for you in Nehemiah chapter 5. You said, how, Tracy, are you going to bring Father's Day into Nehemiah chapter 5? God did it. And he put this message right at the right time. He put, this, he put my schedule right perfectly at this point. Let me give you a quick review if you haven't been a part of this uh, series. Nehemiah is called by God to do a work. He's called to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They're going to rebuild the walls. They're going to rebuild the temple. It's going to be a great thing. Nehemiah does a couple of things. One, he prays. He prays constantly. You'll find uh, numerous prayers. You'll find nine, I believe, different prayers through the, through the book of Nehemiah. What does he do? He prays when something he comes across or confronts, he prays about it. God met the need, answered the prayer, and he steps out by faith. And at times, we as men need to find something worth dying for. And let me tell you, your family is worth dying for. If you don't feel that way, then you are just a sperm donor. And you're wrong. You're evil. Oh, boy. I'm, I'm really going to go now. I can tell it. Okay. See, here's the thing. God created us to protect, to protect from evil. And he gave us a family to die for. Jesus Christ says, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We need to be willing to give ourselves for Jesus Christ. We need to be willing to give ourselves for our families. Nehemiah Nehemiah prays, the doors open. He decides it's time to move forward. Nehemiah moves forward with investigation. He gets cooperation and he has determination. He spends a lot of time in ordinary days to prepare everybody for extraordinary days. And when he rises to build and when we rise to build something for God, when we rise to do something for God, the enemy will always rise to destroy whatever you're doing for God. But Nehemiah said last week, what did he say? And, and, and don't tell me, he said, bring a big pocket knife, because that's what I did last week. Don't say that. He said, he said, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord and fight if you need to, because evil never stops itself. 
Evil never stops itself. Today's anchor verse, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah chapter 5. Verse 19 says this, Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 19, Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Now, my title for my message today, yes, it's Father's Day, but it is this, do the right thing. Do the right thing. Because it's Father's Day, I must, uh, I, I, I may have at, at times deal too much or speak too much to the fathers. Let me tell you, everything that I say today, I believe applies to everyone here. There are certain duties and responsibilities that will be for the husband, the man, the father, but ultimately all of us can be shaped by this message today. When God came to the garden after man had sinned, God knew what had happened and, what, and, and who was responsible. Uh, the man, was it the man? Was it the woman? Was it the devil? And some of you are, are, are looking at me, is this another test? Yes, and it's real easy. All the answers are the same. It's yes, all of them are responsible. See, we have this, we have this thing now that, uh, uh, that, we like to, that we like to place guilt, and we, and we don't like to put group guilt on some, something. But let me tell you, group guilt applies. It applies. Just, just as, just a multi, just as uh, 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 multiple people can be convicted of a charge uh, from involvement in the same crime, when sin occurs, numerous guilty people are often involved. It's not just one person generally. Now, you're responsible for your sin, but so is a person that tempted you with that sin. So is a person that drug you away and led you astray. There, there is group guilt. So what do we need to do? We need to be attacking sin. We need to attack sin, Satan, and the enemy. He, he's attacking us regularly. He's looking, he's looking for different times and different abilities, and he uses various tactics all the time to attack you and to destroy you. One that we want to look at today seems to pop up all throughout history, but we keep falling for it. There, there's, there's something that we can see that we can see all the way back in Genesis, all the way to today, even in today's society. And that sin that we tend to fall for every time is a sin of greed or self-satisfaction or self-interest or self-centeredness. In John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, Jesus Christ is walking on the earth and he's coming into the temple and it's, the pa it's around the Passover. In John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, it says, The Passover of the Jews at hand and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there and making a whip. I love it. I, you, everybody's look, waiting for me to pull a whip out, and I didn't bring it, okay? He, he sat down and made a whip. Now, let me tell you, if you sit down to make a whip, if you've ever made a whip, that is not something that you just throw together. You have time to think as you're braiding those strands together to make a whip. You have time to consider what you're about to do. Think about that, because some people just think he, he just went off and did this. No, he went off, but he went off in a controlled manner. He knew what God wanted done to protect his house of worship. He made a whip. Where was I at? You'll catch me here. Money changer. And, and uh, he made a whip, uh, a whip of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coin on, on, of the money changers and overturned the tables, and he, and he told those who, who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a, a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 13, Jesus is about to cleanse the temple for the second time. And, in, and it says there, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all 
who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and, he, and, the, and uh, the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Greed. Greed. How does Jesus handle people who take advantage of others? It gets him mad, especially his family. His family's coming in. I mean, he, they drove off. They drove out the money changers. They they drove out the ones with with cattle and 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 sacrifices. Now, I love the fact that he didn't he didn't set the pigeons and the and the doves free because ultimately that's what the poor could buy. And he just sent them out. He drove them all out and says, "Greed will not be a part of my house." And what we've done from throughout history is we keep falling for greed. Even in the church, even at the church, we've fallen for greed at times. And it's a sin that will destroy. And it's a sin that God comes, comes against on a regular basis. How important is God's house and his family? It's important enough for his son, Jesus Christ, it's important enough for his son, Jesus Christ, to drive out anything that would destroy the work of God. Fathers, it's your responsibility to drive out anything that would destroy your home, your family. I could probably end there, but I can't. i got to go on, okay? Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30 uh, says there, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. One of our problems in the Western culture is that our thinking about wealth is driven by an atheistic Marxist uh, philosophy other than a biblical philosophy. See, we are taught that there are two kinds of people in the atheistic Marxist philosophy. There's two types of people. There's, there's rich and there's poor. And, and if you're rich, you're what? Evil. And if you're poor, you're good. And that's what's being taught today. And, and, and if, if, you've attended, if you've attended a university, you've probably been influenced by that in some way. And I'm not, I'm not telling you that uh, that was bad. I'm telling you that you need to get a biblical concept of it. The cultural concept is wrong. There's not, the, there's not just the rich and the poor. But the Bible gives us four kinds of people, and, and, and three of those are, are discussed in chapter 5 of Nehemiah. He gives us godly rich, God blesses them, they work hard, they tithe to God, they, they invest smartly and wisely, and, they, and they're generous to others. Then there's the godly poor, hardworking people uh, with integrity, uh, people who are, are, are good stewards of his money but just don't have a lot. You have the ungodly rich, which are, are all about gain and, and, and spend their wealth sinfully. And we have a lot of them today. And then you have the ungodly poor. They do not work. They do not spend wisely. do not tie generously. And they do not invest smartly. So you say, Tracy, there's only two. No, there's four. And when you look at people, always remember that. Do not think of somebody just because they have a little bit of wealth because God has blessed them in so, way, so many ways that they are ungodly. No, there are godly rich, there are ungodly rich. There are godly poor and there are ungodly poor. What's the making of a good leader? We're going to look at that in relation to these ungodly rich, godly rich, and ungodly, or, or godly poor. Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their, their Jewish brethren. For there 
were those who said, with our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get, let us get grain, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of famine. Because of famine. The great famine to come into the land and what's going on. They're, they're mortgaging their, their, their vineyards, their fields, their, even their children. It's getting so bad. And they're crying out because of this. Verse 4, and there, was, and, and there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now, our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers and our children as their children. Yet we are forced, we, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it. Last line. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. Times were tough. Famine was in the land. Let me tell you, the supply chain was broke. As I tell you, the Bible just doesn't tell us what happened. It tells us what always happens. Supply chains broke. There's issues. The taxes are, are rising. A uh, uh, matter of fact, when things get tough, does the government lower your taxes? Well, some of you got your property tax statement in the mail recently? Uh, uh, no, here's what happens. When the government, when, when, when things get rough, the government keeps taxing. And instead of, instead of downsizing, they hire, they, and maybe they did in Nehemiah's time, I don't know, they hired 80,000 IRS agents to make sure you're paying your taxes. It's a tough time. Interest rates are high. Things are going crazy. We're mortgaging our fields, our, fro our, our flocks. We're, we're giving our vineyards away, and, and, and we're going to have nothing. We're going to be back into slavery. And, and let me tell you, you bought us out of slavery. You took us out of slavery, but now we're, we're going back into slavery, and, and some of our slavery is even to our own people. There's people in, in the church. There's people that are coming to worship with me that are taxing me, that are, that are, that are mortgaging my, my, uh, my land, that are repossessing it. There, there's, there's a guy coming up and he's, he's riding my camel. And, and, and my daughter is serving him and she's coming into the temple with me. There's problems. They're, they're creating problems for worship and relationship. That's how tough things are. People are struggling. Lenders are taking the property. This is affecting the relationships of, of everybody and it's affecting even their worship of God. In Galatians chapter 6, verses uh, 10, 7 through 10, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever you sow, one sows. That will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his own flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows it to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due seasons we will reap if we do not give up. So then, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to one another. I love this, the last line, especially to those who are the household of faith. Do the right thing. Here these religious people are, uh, that are businessmen probably in the temple, they are also taking advantage of the godly poor. And an outcry comes. In Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 6 through 13, goes on to say, I was very angry. Nehemiah hears this. He hears this outcry. They're coming to him. We have people uh, in Jerusalem that are taking advantage of us. The king's taxes aren't getting any lower. Uh, we're mortgaging everything. There's a famine. The supply chain's broke. Interest rates are high. I can't borrow any money because I can't afford the interest rate. Things are tough. And what can you do for us, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah was very angry when he heard their outcry and these words. 
I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I want to stop there for a second because it's important. Men, when you come against, when you come, when something comes to you that you know is wrong and you need to deal with, follow Nehemiah's example. He was very angry, but he took counsel with himself. He thought it through. He thought it through. Have you ever not thought something through? Guys, have you ever just have you ever just counterpunched and got in trouble? Yeah, yeah, you do you've done that before. Come on, you've done that. I did that the other day. I was working on a lawnmower. And when I pulled out my high lift jack because I was gonna do some stuff underneath it and and that jack didn't work. And my wife was out in the backyard and I wish she hadn't been out in the backyard. <laughs> didn't say anything. But those high lift jacks are big and heavy and I picked that thing up and I, it wasn't working. I threw that on the ground and I ah! did this number. And I live in town. I'm sure other people heard too. Um, but after I did that, some of you are laughing because you, you would have done the same thing, I'm sure. Uh, after I did that, I'm thinking, how stupid. That, that almost bounced back and hit me in the leg. That would have been great. How would I explain that on Sunday? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. He took counsel on himself, and he says, I can't do anything. I can't do something physically, but I can do something. I can bring charges against these people. I can go through the right channels, and I can call a giant meeting with these people, and, and I can address it. And he says, I said to them, you're exacting interest each from your brother, and I, and I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have, brought, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that, you might, that, that they might be sold to us. Here we've just been in slavery for, we've been in bondage or we've been in exile for 141 years. And now we have, we have bought back people that were slaves. We had brought back people that were slaves and we brought them into Jerusalem. And now once again, because of, because of the famine, because of the high interest rate, because of what you can get, because of the greed that you have in your heart and in your mind, you are taking advantage of the brothers and you're putting them right back into slavery. And they were silent and they could not find words to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. No, duh. Let me tell you, when you start taking advantage of people, now, now there is an interest rate. There, there is, if, if you loan somebody money and, and they pay you back, they ought to be gracious enough to pay you something extra for the time and the money that you put in. I, I, I recognize that. But at some point, when, when you start seeing what your neighbor is getting and you start raising your rates and raising your abilities to, to take advantage of the people, you're in trouble. I was a landlord for, for many years, and, and uh, uh, not as many as some of you, but... Uh, uh, but let me tell you, I, I had some good renters at times that, you know what? I didn't raise their rent because they were such good renters. I had an older lady that uh, until her family moved her out to a, to a facility in California, I kept her rent. Now, you guys are going to be astonished at this. $210 a month. Now, the whole time. I think I charged you guys more, didn't I? Probably so. Well, <laughs> Uh, but he, here's the fact. I didn't want to take advantage. I, I didn't have greed in my heart and mind. And, and, and there's something to be said with making a living. I don't, I don't want to put that down. But ultimately, you know when you're taking advantage of somebody. You know when you've, when you've made a deal too good. You know when you're, when you're hurting somebody so that you can, you, can, you can do more than thrive 
and they do more than they do less than struggle. Goes on to say, where was I at? Uh, we'll do ten. We'll start ten. Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money. He's lending them money, giving them grain. Let's abandon this exacting of interest. Now, and return to them. Verse 11, return to them this very day, their fields, their vineyards, and their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have exacted from them. That's above and beyond what they gave you, what they owed you. Then they said, we will, verse 12, then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priest and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out of my fold, uh, I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said amen and, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. As I told you, he was angry. He took counsel with himself. He did not sin in what he was doing. He did the right thing. Guys, we got to do the right thing. Not just, just because it, it's legal doesn't mean it's sinful. Or just because it's legal doesn't mean that we can get away with it with God. It can be legal, but it can be sinful. God's law is higher than man's law. And men, at times, we need to make godly appeals. We need to make a godly appeal to our nation. We need to make godly appeals to our education systems. We need to make godly appeals to, to sometimes the leadership in our church. We need to make godly appeals so that, one, we stay in the right perspective with God and his will. Godly rich reply properly with repentance and restitution. Those godly rich men that, that, that had been coming to the temple with them and, and, and had been exacting high interest from these people, they, they decided, I don't need this much. I can survive with this. Why don't, we just, why don't we just work together to make this work out? We're not talking about a bunch of people that were, that were ungodly poor there. We're not talking about, you, about a bunch of 30-year-old guys that are living in the basement of, of their mother's house uh, being taken to Walmart to buy their groceries because they don't have their driver's license. See, we're not talking about today's culture, even though today's culture has gotten more God, ungodly, poor. And I say this, I, let me say this to you, and, and this will step on some more toes, and I, and I, and I don't apologize. Um, here it is. We got, we got guys today, men, men today, they're shaving. God gave his life God gave his life at 33 years old for the sins of the world. And you're living in your mom's basement. Let me tell you, men take responsibility. If you have your son living in your basement right now, and you're a man... Tell your wife, stop cutting, stop cutting the crust off his sandwiches for him. <laughs> Start there and work your way up. Now, some of you are giving me the dare, dead stare now. I better get, keep going. Some would say, well, our capitalistic society is wrong. Well, let me tell you this. 
Capitalism without Judeo-Christian values will always fail. Capitalism without Judeo-Christian values will always fail. Capitalism works when the godly rich outnumber the ungodly rich. Our capitalism country is being controlled by currently the ungodly rich. In Matthew chapter 6, it's on your, on your uh, uh, Bible reading there. And I'm not going to take the time to read that to, today, but it talks about laying up treasures for yourself in heaven instead of on earth. And that's important. I want, I want to, though, take you to Luke chapter 18, verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. There comes a time when you, guys, it's time to do the right thing. It's time to do the right thing. We've got to, we've got to live for the next generation, not for our generation. I love my generation. I, I, love, I love people with gray in their hair. Some of you do a real good job of hiding it too. But, but I, I love it. I, I think, we've, I think we're, we're not the greatest generation because many of them are passing. I, I really think we had a greater generation even than ours. But ultimately, we need to pass more on to the next generation. We need to pass not more money. We need to pass more values. We need to pass more morality. We need to pass more life. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says, In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. We also need to be men of, we need to be men of, that are above reproach. We need to be families that are above reproach. I'm not going to take time to read, but I encourage you to read uh, verses 14 through 18. And what this talks about here is Nehemiah, instead of taking what they normally would have paid the governor, he says, I'm paying my own way. I'm taking care of it. At, at one point you say, well, he was just barely skimming by. No, he, 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 has a, he has a group of men that he comes and he meets with, 150, and at his expense. Is Nehemiah, uh, uh, is, is Nehemiah an ungodly rich or is Nehemiah godly rich? He, he, did, he did take some from them, but he did not take anything that was exorbitant. He paid his own way. We have generations right now that aren't paying their own way. Like I said, at 33, Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world. And at 33, we have people living in the basement of their mother's house. Now, I say that, and I, and I think one day I may live in the basement of my children's house. I don't know. We'll just have to see. Uh, that'll be to care for me, guys. Okay. Guys, we need to do the right thing. Bubba was telling me the other day uh, about a coupon book that he used to sell that, that, that people would come in and they would use a coupon book to get their steak and they would order water and they would get a steak and then they would also not leave a tip. So they would go in a restaurant, eat for free. Now, do the right thing. Vicki and I, don't know if you've noticed, we've lost some weight. Yes, we, have. we have noticed that. <sighs> um, lost some weight. You don't want me to tell how much or anything like that, do you? Okay, all right. I do. I want to tell. I want to own or brag. We lost some weight. And part of, the, part of the plan is at times we go places and we split a meal. Some of you eat some pretty big meals. We split a meal. 
cut it in half. Sometimes they'll bring us two plates. You know what? I tip really, really good when we split a meal. I tip really good. I mean, I, I, it's not the 20%. It, it may be 25, it may be 30% I tip when we split a meal. You say, Tracy, you could have saved that money. You could have went to your retirement. You could have given that to your kids. You got a new grandson, you're, he's going to need more toys. Yeah. And you know what I say? I say, no, do the right thing. Do the right thing. You know? What happens when that, when that uh, uh, waitress walks in here and sits in our service and looks over and says, oh, there's, the, there's that family that didn't tip at all and they left crumbs all over the floor. <laughs> First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. God has given you gifts. He's blessed you with knowledge, ability, with wisdom, with skills, with talent, and abilities. Use them as good stewards to serve one another. Do the right thing. Happy Father's Day, I'm closing. Do the right thing. A mark of a good leader, a mark of a good father is this. To have pure motives. Do things for the right reason. Number two is to be above reproach. It's so important to be above reproach. Guys, don't, don't uh, and, and this doesn't happen today because things are so different than they used to be, but I remember back in the day, you'd pick up the phone and it was attached to a wall. And, and the kid would answer it and say, uh, they'd ask for the father and the father would look over, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> and that's not living above reproach. I just told her about how old I am, don't I? Didn't I? Okay. And then the last is be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Nehemiah wouldn't have made the right choices if he hadn't, what? Sat down and consulted with himself. And I believe that was also a time of prayer for himself to consider what should I do and what's the right thing to do. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 19. Remember me, O God. O my God. Remember for my good, O my God, that I have done for these people. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it, enter by it, are many. Verse 14, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. I speak again to fathers. You guys need to be pointing yourself and your family towards a narrow gate all the time. The, 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 the wide gate, the culture is running. As I told you, the other, maybe it was last week, it's a highway to hell. It, it de definitely is a highway to hell. My goodness, lots of people are going that direction. And if you find yourself in a huge crowd of people and you're all going the same direction, you need to sometimes question yourself. There's another way. We were at Sight and Sound Theater not too long ago for, for Faith's birthday. There you are back there. Seeing, seeing the, the, the uh, Esther, Book of Esther. Great time. We ended up setting up a little high. And you know what? Everybody heads down for the exit. And it's like, I'm headed up for the exit. And we headed up 
and out a door and down some steps and we were out, we were gone. And we ran to the car. It was pretty hilarious too, uh, to watch us run through the car. But guys, sometimes you need to look for a different way. The world doesn't have the answers. Do the right thing. You want the track to success? And I want you to teach your children the track for success? You want to be successful? Here, here's three, maybe four points to make you successful. Number one, graduate from high school. You, you, want, to, you want to be uh, almost bulletproof for living in poverty? The first step is to graduate from high school. The second step is this, work a full-time job. Don't find one of these part-time, you know, I can get by, I can buy video games once a month and I can, I can eat cheese pizza. No, get a full-time job. Marry a woman, guys. <laughs> Some of you are just now getting it. Guys, you want success? Graduate from high school. Work a full-time job and marry a woman. And then have children. This statistically will guarantee you, will nearly guarantee you, it's almost 100%, that you and your children will not live in poverty. Will not live in poverty. That's a goal. That's a goal that you should have for your children. You don't want them to live in poverty. You say, Tracy, what about higher education? Yes, for, for many, for a lot, higher education is the next step. But ultimately, let me tell you, it all comes back down to graduate, get a full-time job, and, and marry, and have children after you marry. And based on those things, you're gonna have a pretty good life. But you know what? I also find those are biblical standards also. I don't, I'm gonna close with this. I'm gonna close with the scripture. And I'm gonna walk off after the scripture, but here's what I wanna tell you. Men, you have a great responsibility. And I don't care if you're a father, if you're a grandfather, you're a soon-to-be father, or you don't have any kids at all. Let me, if you're a man here today, God has placed a responsibility on you for people. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. I, I read the news the other day. Well, it was this morning early, real early this morning. 46 Nigerian Christians were massacred. 46 Nigerian Christians were massacred at the neglect, it says, of the government. It's time for people to start standing up and do the right thing. Stand. Make a stand. Let your voice be heard. Nehemiah could have just walked away from those group of people and said, you know, you guys are going to have to work it out on your own. You've got contracts. You've got legal documents. You're going to have to just work through that. No, he called those people all together and brought them to the table and said, this is what we need to do. And they listened to the Spirit of God and changed their ways. Will you listen to the Spirit of God today and change your ways? First Thessalonians chapter 5, let's stand. Verse 15, 16 through 24, it says here, it says, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Can I hear some rejoicing? Yeah. Amen. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from all, every, every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. God bless you. Hey you guys, welcome back. You know, Brian's going to give us some good information about what's going on at the Hill. Yeah, that's right. So we want you to be able to stay connected. So the easiest way for you to do that is just to hop on over to our website, take a look at our church calendar. That's going to keep you up to date on everything that we have going on. But most likely you're on our YouTube channel right now. So if you haven't already, go ahead and do us a favor and like and subscribe and maybe even share if you were ministered to by this message. So we also wanted to make available to you how to support us here at the Hill. So the best way to do that is through prayer. Uh, also a very practical way to do that is through giving. And so if you go to thehillministries.church slash give, that allows you to uh, give securely online. And that means a lot to us. It allows us to keep things moving forward as we spread the gospel. And lastly, we have got social media on Facebook and Instagram. So again, those are just great ways to kind of just visually stay involved and up to date on what's going on here. You're going to see pictures of recent events. You're going to see promo of upcoming events and just all the ways to just help you feel a part because we very much consider our online family a part of what we have going on here. So Jeremy, any final thoughts? It is. The world's gone crazy, but God is still firm. <laughs> That's right. God bless. Amen. Mm -hmm. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.